Boss fights are one of the most iconic parts of video games, and this is no accident. Bosses serve as towering behemoths, ready to test the player on the skills that they have built while playing the game. Of course, there is a lot of variety in the way that games handle their bosses. A Shovel Knight boss is going to be different than a Hollow Knight boss, which will be different than a Hyper Light Drifter boss, which will be different than a Cuphead boss. In spite of all of their differences, however, there are some underlying similarities that almost all bosses share, and today on Design Deliberation, we're going to analyze what goes into a good boss fight. Without further ado, let's begin. Before talking about how to make a boss fight, we first need to discuss the purpose that boss fights serve, and when they should be used. According to former Insomniac designer Mike Stout, there are several fundamental goals that game designers should strive to achieve when designing a boss. Let's look at these goals one by one and break down why they are so important. Firstly, a boss fight should feel like a reward. If you've designed your bosses well, players will look forward to them with anticipation because the act of fighting them is so engaging. Oftentimes, boss fights can be a break from normal gameplay. Many boss fights are spiced up with new mechanics for the player to use, or they can be a break from fighting just your standard run-of-the-mill enemies. There's a whole genre of games that have taken this idea that boss fights should be rewarding and ran with it, and they're known as boss rushes. Boss rush games like Fury, Punch-Out, and Cuphead all feature boss fights exclusively, and they are a great place to study what makes a boss fight so interesting, because they have nothing else mechanically to stand on. What these games show us is that a boss fight should always be interesting to engage with. Making a boss tedious to fight, or simply making them annoying, is a good way to frustrate your players. They also show us that boss fights can be rewarding for other reasons. Just look at Cuphead, for example. Every frame of animation in Cuphead has been drawn and inked by hand in the style of a 1930s Fleischer or Disney cartoon. The animations are like nothing else in the market, and players look forward to watching such a spectacle of animation. Oftentimes, boss fights will also have some great music, which can also help a boss feel more like a reward. No matter what genre of game you're creating, though, your boss should always be interesting to interact with. Boss fights should also feel like a milestone. Generally, boss fights are climactic moments in a game, and they can be quite a challenge to defeat. However, it is their challenge that makes them special, and when a player finally pushes through and defeats a boss, they should feel as if they have accomplished something truly remarkable. The taller the mountain, the greater the joy when you finally reach the summit. Cuphead is a great example of this. The bosses are tough as nails, and I died to them many times, but when I finally landed the killing blow, I felt fantastic. If your player doesn't feel like they've accomplished something special when they beat your boss, you're doing something wrong. Boss fights should also test the player's mastery. Over the course of a game, the player is going to need to learn certain skills in order to progress, and boss fights are a great place to test your players on these skills. Oftentimes, developers will have a specific skill that they're trying to test their players on when they fight a boss. For good examples of this, look no further than Shovel Knight. The Treasure Knight fight tests the player on their ability to platform in the water, which was a major theme of the level. Or there is Propeller Knight, who tests the player on their ability to platform with wind which again was a major theme of that level. Building your boss fights to test the player on the mechanics displayed throughout your game gives players a chance to demonstrate their mastery over those mechanics. Well done boss fights should serve as a final exam of sorts over the mechanics of your game. Good boss fights also serve to build tension on multiple levels. Think back to your high school literacy classes and the literary tension curve. The literary tension curve describes the four phases which are present in almost every story. Typically, the story doesn't start off with a high amount of narrative tension. Once the story has begun and all the major players have been introduced, the story enters the rising action. While the story is in the rising action, tension steadily rises until the story reaches its climax. 
which is the most intense part of the narrative. After the climax, there is usually a short period of falling action which wraps up the story. This is the narrative tension curve, and games employ it on multiple levels. On a game-wide level, the game should increase in difficulty or tension as the game goes on, and boss fights can be a great tool to raise the stakes. It can also be applied on a per-level basis as well. A level will generally increase in difficulty and complexity over time, and a boss oftentimes serves as the climax of a level. You can also apply the tension curve to the boss fight itself, as well as the individual attacks, but I will talk more about that at a later point in this video. If a boss can satisfy all four of these goals, chances are it will be a good boss fight. But how can a designer create a boss that satisfies these four goals? There are a couple of general rules to keep in mind when designing a boss, and the rest of this video is going to talk about some of the fundamentals of boss fights, and we're going to begin by talking about telegraphing. Telegraphing is one of the most important parts of boss fight design, and it is one of the largest factors that determines the difficulty of an attack. When a boss goes to attack, they don't launch their attack immediately. Instead, they take their time to wind up before launching the attack. These wind-up animations are called telegraphs, and they are very important. In order for an attack to feel fair, the player needs to know that an attack is coming. If the player doesn't know that an attack is coming, but they still take damage from that attack, that damage will feel cheap and unearned, which can leave the player feeling frustrated. Telegraphs tell the player that an attack is coming, which attack is coming, and possibly where it is coming. If an attack is properly telegraphed, the player will be able to avoid taking damage. And if they do take damage, it will be their own fault for not reacting quickly enough. Developers can also change the difficulty of an attack by altering the length of the telegraphs. Generally, you will find that the more damaging or harder to avoid attacks will have longer telegraphs to give the player more time to prepare for them than the smaller, easier to avoid attacks, since they are smaller and easier to avoid. And this brings us back to the narrative tension curve. Telegraphs tie into the narrative tension curve for an individual attack. Before the telegraph begins, the tension will be fairly low, at least in comparison to what comes next. But then, the player sees the telegraph animation, and suddenly, the tension starts to rise and rise as the player attempts to get out of the way until the attack is launched and the climax is reached. The player will either dodge the attack or they won't, but either way, they will have a moment or two to rest as falling action before they need to dodge the next attack. Phases are another tool that designers can use to keep a fight interesting. Oftentimes, when fighting a boss, after it has taken a certain amount of damage, it will change up its attacks for the rest of the fight. When a boss switches to a new set of attacks, or some new factor to the fight is introduced, the player enters a new phase. These distinct sections of a boss fight are called phases, and oftentimes, developers will use them to keep longer fights from feeling tedious. To understand why designers use phases, think back to the tension curve. If the boss uses the same attack patterns over and over throughout the entire fight, you'll have a very flat tension curve overall, which is sort of boring. If you want a good example of what this kind of fight looks like, look at the Watcher Knight fight from Hollow Knight. At the beginning of the fight, the player only fights one of the Watcher Knights, and once that one is defeated, the player needs to fight two of them at the same time. So far, so good. However, from this point forward, the fight remains exactly the same. The player fights two of the Watcher Knights at a time until they have defeated six of them in total. This is the most arduous fight in Hollow Knight, and this is because it is a very long fight with very little variation in boss attack patterns to keep things interesting for the entire duration of the fight. Compare this fight to the Mantis Lord fight, again from Hollow Knight, which has a similar format to the Watcher Knight fight, but handles it in a much more interesting way. Just like the Watcher Knight fight, the Mantis Lords require the player to beat them one by one, 
However, there is one key difference that makes this fight much more interesting. The Mantis Lords use more effective phases. At the start of the fight, you only fight one of the Mantis Lords, but once you deal enough damage, you'll need to fight the other two. Unlike the Watcher Knights, when the Mantis Lords team up, they actually use a completely new set of attacks than before, which is more interesting than just fighting off another version of the same enemy for the entire fight. Using phases also gives the player many victories throughout the fight. Even if the player dies, they can still be proud that they finally made it to a new phase, and it can make them feel better after a defeat. The important thing to remember about boss fights is that the stakes should be constantly escalating, and phases are a great way to accomplish this. There's so much more to boss battle design, but these are some of the factors that come up in almost every single good boss fight. However, there is a lot of variation in what works and what doesn't work when it comes to boss fights. Sometimes boss fights are sprinkled throughout the game, and sometimes there's only one final boss. Sometimes the players fight a boss in a procedurally generated arena, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes the bosses are mandatory, and sometimes they aren't. Sometimes they are puzzles, and sometimes they aren't. My point is, the field of boss design is wide open, and as long as the fight is interesting and feels fair, the sky is the limit when it comes to designing a boss. There isn't some grand, unifying formula that all boss fights should follow because it is the one, objectively best, style of boss. Two games could have completely different styles of bosses, and both games could have excellent boss fights, even though they are complete opposites when it comes to their design philosophy. The most important thing to remember when designing a boss is to be creative and keep things interesting. I hope you have enjoyed this basic exploration of boss fight design. There is a lot of stuff relating to boss design that I had to leave out of this video, but perhaps I'll feel the urge to visit this topic again in the future. So subscribe so you don't miss the next video I make about boss design, if I ever do make another video about boss design. Also, did you know that I have a Twitter account? Well, I do, and following me there can be a great way to be informed about channel news without having to wait for my next video. This has been Chariot Rider. Have a good day.